when Cassie asked me to speak tonight, I had two things in mind that I was thinking, well, that would be good, that would be good. And I really thought I was going to speak on another one. And Jesus said, nope, you're going to do your favorite story. I was like, really? Okay, that's cool. So I knew what the scripture was that he wanted me to speak about. I have been reading on it for really almost a year and just researching in my spare time and thinking about it and studying a lot. And it was about Peter. And anybody in our life group knows that's that's my man, that's my guy there, other than Rob, of course. Um, <laughs> but Peter seems to get picked on a lot. Um, I've read a lot of different things people have written about him, and admittedly, he sticks his foot in his mouth quite often. In fact, he seemed to have a big problem. He is known as the one who could speak before he thought. He's even known as the one who could act too quickly and cut people's ears off. You know that story? Um, He landed in trouble more than once. And to be transparent and very honest, kind of like naked before you in a sense, Peter's one of my favorite people because I can identify with him. I've often been in many situations where, wait, I just said that? That was wrong. That wasn't what I meant it to be. That wasn't what my heart was really thinking. And I've done some things. Jesus, I didn't just do that, did I? So I can I can identify with Peter. But Peter, despite his faults, he was a great man of faith. We're going to talk about that tonight. And many lessons can be learned from the good things Peter said and the good things he did but also the the bad things he said. So we're going to talk about the story of him walking on the water. I think we take this story too lightly. I think we're very familiar with this story. I think we, I, have learned that we miss a lot of parts of this story. It's, It's not long. It's short. We're going to go over those verses in a minute. Before this story takes place, Peter had just, with the other disciples, had just witnessed Jesus do a miracle. Jesus had just broke the bread, five loaves and two fishes. We all know that story. And he prayed over it, and he multiplied it, and he multiplied it, and he multiplied it. And they fed, we know there were 5,000 men, but that doesn't even include the women and the children, if you read and study the background on that. So that's a lot of people. There were even leftovers, 12 baskets, one for each disciple. That was big. They had never, ever seen Jesus take food, bless him, and just keep breaking it and breaking it and never running out. They were eyewitness to that miracle. But just a few hours later, Peter finds himself in danger. He's not sure what this outcome is going to be, and he's very afraid. Okay, let's pick up the story in Matthew, if you have your Bible. We're going to be in chapter 14, and we're going to start with verse 22. Again, I'm in the New Living Translation. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Okay, so they, the disciples are in a storm, and we get a description of it. But notice this in the very beginning. It says, immediately, Jesus insisted that his disciples get into the boat and go across the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful place. I I had the pleasure of going on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and I couldn't help but think about Peter that day. I just cried and cried. Peter walked on this water. Jesus sent them into that storm. Did you catch that? We don't like to think of our Jesus that way. Sometimes we believe the storms or the difficult situations that we are in that Satan put us there. We give him way too much credit. Okay? This can't be happening to me. 
you know, I, I can't survive this. Why is this taking so long? Why, why, why? But sometimes Jesus puts us in storms for a reason. Okay, would you agree with that? You open your mind up to that idea tonight? Um, <clears throat> at one point, we're all going to face storms. The Bible even tells us we're all going to have trials and tribulations. No one gets through life scot-free. At one point or another, you're going to feel like the, scar, the sky is darkened and the winds are raising and you're in a modern-day Galilean storm like Peter. But John's Gospel also tells us this story. And he says, one night the disciples went down to the lake where they got into the boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. While they were two to three miles from the shore. Okay, you're in a boat. The waves are raging. It says a strong wind began to blow and the waters grew rough. This was a moment for a crisis. Two to three miles, you can't swim back to shore in the dark, in the middle of a storm. You're not getting out that boat. Let's be real. You're going to hide in that boat. Okay, I'm speaking for myself. I would hide in that boat. So, the disciples are fighting a strong wind, and what are they fighting with? Oars. Now, my husband was born and raised here. He grew up fishing, shrimping, all the things, you know. He knows how to do the boats. He's big into safety. My son-in-law loves boats. I've been on boats with both of them. We have been in storms, caught in the rain and stuff like that before, but we didn't have oars. We have motors. Okay, so we got out of our storm quickly. So they're battling with paddles, basically, is what I think of. They're being tossed about from one side of the boat to the other, and they're being pelted by the rain. I want you to get this picture. When you read the Bible, I hope you use your imagination, because it will make the Bible come alive to you. They're being pelted. Have you ever been pelted by rain? It stings. It doesn't feel too good. They're probably thinking this. Now, this is not in the Bible. This is a Michelle Miller thing. But I've had a lot of time to think about this. The disciples are fighting, and they're probably thinking, why did Jesus send us out in this water, in this storm? Do you think that crossed their mind? They're human. I'm human. I would have thought of that. Okay? Do you think they were thinking, uh, where is he right now? Does he see us? I think they would have been thinking that. Do you think they were thinking, we're not going to survive this? We're going to drown. There's no hope. I think they did. I think they were probably thinking, if only Jesus was in this boat with us, we wouldn't be having this storm. Do we act like that and think like that sometimes? Yeah. If only Jesus had told me to stay over here on the shore, I wouldn't be going through this. Have we ever done that? If he had warned me, I'd have never done this. I wouldn't find myself over here. But he was not in their boat. He was nowhere to be seen. Have you ever been in a hard, terrifying storm in your life where you felt, you were too far from a solution, too long in a struggle. I'll share something with you. Four years it took to settle my dad's succession. There was a lot of strife, a lot of family division. I was being sued by a family member. A lot of stuff. There were times when I was on the floor saying, God, this can't be you. You, you can't. This can't be what you want. It was way too long. But guess what? I give all the glory to God. He turned that whole situation around. The person that sued me wanted me to film this tonight so that she could hear it. Y'all, she was not liking me at all. She didn't talk to me for two and a half, three years. And that was my sister. We're one year apart, and we used to be very close. We're close again. God redeemed it. So even when you're in the middle of a storm, and I know now, you don't always know when you're put in a storm why God put you in that storm. I know now why we went through all of that. I would do that all again. I would. I would Rob and I have had this discussion. 
we've been asked. Would you go through cancer and all that stuff, that, all the surgeries, all that, again, to be where you are today? Yes, I would. And so would Rob. Would you go through all of that, your dad dying, you being the executor, people getting mad, screaming at you, not talking to you, suing you, all of that, to be where I am today with her? Guess what? I would choose it all over again. Because that had to happen for me to get to the good side. Are you catching that? Okay. So I thought I was too long fighting in a court system, too long Rob battling a sickness, too long without answers, <laughs> too long without relief. I'd never been an executrix, as my sister proudly wanted to tell me I was saying that wrong. But, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I really didn't. But I learned as I went. And God held my right hand, and he never let go. And I've had the opportunity to pray for people that have had cancer. I've had the opportunity to pray for people that are being sued. I've had the opportunity to pray for people whose family members weren't talking to them. And to encourage them, because I've been there. So the storms of life appear in many forms. Some are huge like that. Some are small. They arise unexpected, and we like to say they rain on our parade. Um... Some of them are just simple, like a bad day at work, um, annoying car trouble, losing your keys, losing your sunglasses, and they're on top of your head. Y'all ever done stuff like that? Locking yourself out of the house. Or maybe just, you know, everyday challenges of parenting or getting along with your spouse. Yeah, Rob and I are not perfect. We have those moments, too. Sometimes storms linger longer than we anticipated, like I said, and they test our patience and endurance. But larger storms, I learned, they have a far deeper and longer lasting impact. They hang around for weeks, months, or even years. These storms can be overwhelming, and you feel like you're not going to survive. But the main thing about storms that are large like that, they get our attention. And they take our focus off of Jesus. There were times my husband, my children, and people sitting in this room were like, you are overwhelmed. This is all you were thinking about. I saw my whole life through that storm for a long time because I took my eyes, I'm not proud of it, off of Jesus. Let's continue reading. This is, there's more to this story, and so imagine, unimaginable things are about to happen. Let's pick up in verse 25. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. When I look at that, I think the I am is here. The all-encompassing, I got everything, I can do anything, I am is here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat, and he walked on the water towards Jesus. Okay, we all know the story, but I think, like I said earlier, we read it too fast, and we take a lot of things for granted. The disciples are seeing something on the water, and they cry out in fear. What did they cry? It's a ghost. Okay, I'm sure it was a terrifying sight. We kind of overlooked this part. Nothing like this had ever happened, ever, in all of history. Somebody's walking on the water. That's not an everyday occurrence. And it turns out that figure walking on the water is Jesus. We take that for granted. As Jesus approaches, he reassures them. He wants them to take heart. He doesn't want them to be afraid. I'm sure this miracle must have been the most surprising an unexpected thing they had seen Jesus do up to this point. 
Just think about that in a minute, for a minute. You're in a storm, you're in the boat, you see a figure, and it's Jesus. But wait, he's walking on water in a storm? Okay, so they're witnessing a supernatural miracle. And then Peter says, a lot of people get this story wrong. They think Jesus told Peter, come out here and walk on the water. He did tell him that. But Peter said he asked for a command. He said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to get out of the boat. He asked for it. So Peter's getting out of the boat in a storm. The rest of the disciples, I can just imagine. They're watching carefully. They're used to Peter shooting off his mouth. And they want to know if he's going to follow through on this deal. Jesus just told him to come. Is he going to go? Or is he going to look like a fool? We all know what he did. But I'm saying all this to say, what are these disciples thinking? And then Peter puts one foot out. He puts the other foot out. He's standing on the water. You got to stand before you can walk. Let that sink in. You have to stand before you can walk. Then he begins to take a step and he's walking on the water. Amazing. Amazing. He's, he, God enabled him to do what he could never do on his own. To walk on water. Peter is doing, I want you to get this. God showed me this today. Michelle, don't you see it? I said, what, Lord? Peter is doing what I was doing. You get that? Aren't we supposed to do what Jesus does? Okay. Side note. We're not going to go to the next verses at the bottom. I'm just going to let that cat out of the bag right now, but we're going to talk about it. When we think of Peter walking on the water, what's the first thing that people focus on in this story? Give me some feedback. Yes, he sank. Y'all, that says a lot about us. I'm going to be honest. Why do we only concentrate on the negative? Why isn't our first thought, Peter was the only one who got out the boat. Peter, in all of history, is the only human that walked on the water. Peter did a miracle. He went and did what Jesus was doing. You see why we have the problem? We think about the negative. That's, this is really the way Jesus would want us to think about this story. But, you know, I still have those disciples in that boat. I don't see any of the 11, even though Peter gets out and he starts taking a step and he's walking, I don't see any of them trying to get out the boat. Do you see him getting out the boat? What an event. Peter chose to cry out to Jesus, that's what the Bible says, and go to him, to obey the command and go to him. Peter did not question Jesus. I'm going to step on my own toes right here. He didn't tell Jesus about his situation or complain about it and say, you don't understand what I'm going through, Lord. I can't go out this boat. We're in the middle of it. He never did that. He didn't even ask Jesus, hey, can you change my circumstances? Don't we all do these things if we're honest? Okay, I'll speak about myself. I do these things. Actually, Peter was not, I believe, when he asked Jesus and he immediately got out that boat and took those steps, he wasn't thinking about the waves and the storm any more. Peter chose not to be afraid. He chose to do what Jesus did. He took courage. Ladies, this is faith in action. God has given us all a seed of faith, but it's up to us how we use it. I don't want to get to heaven and, you know, Jesus say something to me and I left stuff on the table. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't want to be that person. So in the middle of the tremendous storm, Peter chose faith over fear. 
Peter recognizes Jesus. I believe he knew his voice. He wanted to be with Jesus because he knew. No matter how dark it got, no matter how bad the circumstances was, it's better with, um, if I'm with Jesus. It's safe if I'm with Jesus. Amazingly, Peter climbs out of the boat. He doesn't fall through the water. He walks on it. But Peter does the imaginable only by what? Had nothing to do with Peter. Zero. Nothing. It was all by the power of God. He did what was hopelessly impossible by stepping out of the boat in faith and following the command of Jesus. Just one word. Come. That's all he told him. He didn't tell him how to do it. Do it in five minutes or let's wait. Jesus just says, come. You know why he's saying that? Because he still says that today. He says, come. Come as you are. Come in the middle of all your mess. I'm right here. It's me. In Peter's mind, I believe, something switched on him that night. He had no reason to believe he couldn't do this thing. He couldn't do what Jesus was doing as long as Jesus made it happen. You trying to see where we're going? We want to make it happen. But when you get your mind focused on, I can do anything if Jesus is doing it and Jesus is telling me, y'all, that takes the pressure off of us. Okay? Safety's found with Jesus. When the storm rages, be like Peter. I hope you remember this. Run to Jesus. Jesus is our only safe place. I am 63 years old. My goal for the rest of my life is I want everyone I meet, everyone I speak to, to learn from all the mistakes I've made and grow faster and go farther than I ever have. So learn from this. Okay? Jesus is your only safe place. You can trust him above all others. Your friend, she ain't going to help you. She might pray for you. She's not going to get you out of the storm. I had to learn that the hard way. Your husband, he loves me. He could not get me out of the storm. He could he could talk to me. I mean, of course Rob did that. He prayed for me, hugged me, all those things. But where did my real peace come from? It wasn't from Rob Miller. It was from Jesus. It was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Did I have to repent and cry and sit? Repent cry, sit, again and again, sometimes, many times in one day, yes, but every time I met and sat with Jesus, I felt his peace, and I was loved there. Okay, so what kept those people in that boat, those other 11? I have some thoughts that I, I'm a questioner, that's how I learn. What kept them in the boat? Was it because they didn't recognize Jesus? You know, I started to do this until I lost my sunglasses the other day. But I was going to bring my sunglasses and put them on and say, you know, they couldn't recognize Jesus if they're looking through the storm and that's all they're focused on. Okay? Did they believe it was even Jesus on the water? That had never happened before. See, they were focused on their circumstances. How do I know that? The Bible says they were terrified. Okay, now, here we go. When you are terrified, that is a spirit of fear. So they were operating in fear. Ladies, when we are so fixed on our situation and our circumstances, we will become fearful. Focusing on fear, if you don't write anything else down, focusing on fear changes what we see. You'll start operating everything out of fear. Everything's out of fear. The good news is, though, when we will look up and put our eyes on Jesus and cry out to him, I promise you, everything you see changes. Everything. 
Peter took courage. He t- chose faith over his fears and his focus changed. And did you notice, just like Jesus said immediately, it was immediate for Peter. We make it complicated. Jesus says, I'm here. Just look up. Look up. I'm right here. In that split second, he was changed. His focus changed. So what does faith look like? Faith stands on the truth of God and his word. His word, this right here, it will never fail you. Never fail you. He is faithful to keep every promise in this book. That's faith. Faith looks beyond circumstances. Peter looked beyond the circumstances of the waves. He wasn't waiting for that storm to stop. And faith doesn't hesitate. Peter heard the call. He knew it was Jesus. And immediately he took a step of faith. It never says he hesitated or he had to think about it. There was no delay. Jesus said it, I'm going. Okay. This is the important thing that Jesus kind of switched my message. So this is for y'all. He said this, add this to the thing. I said, okay, God, I'm going to obey you. Fear and faith are coming. You can't, you can have some faith, but you can't have fear at the same time. They're opposites. You're either operating in faith or you're operating in fear. Now, here we go. Who is, well, let me say this way. Fear is based on lies. Always. Can't change it. The devil has fed you a line and you have bought into it and you believe it. Who's the father of lies? What's his language? We are kingdom children. That is not our language. We talked about that at the um, Tall Timbers. Lies never agree with God's word. Never. Fear says, I won't survive this. Fear says, I'm alone. Nobody gets this. Nobody has it as bad as me. This is too much for me. Fear says, I'm not good enough. I can't do what Jesus just told me to do. I'm not going to make it. But we have to recognize all those things I just said or read. That's language of lies. Jesus would never tell us any of those things. If it doesn't line up with God's word, it's a lie. It's easy. We make it hard. Remember, opposite, fear and faith. Faith is based on God's truth. And it's found in his word. And faith is based on the promises of God. If you were at the Thrive Retreat, you got, they gave out the Hung by the Tongue books by uh, our founding pastor, Brother Francis Morton. And he says this in this book. It is so powerful, y'all. He says, faith is acting like God told you the truth. You need to write that down, put it on a sticky note, and put it on your mirror. Put it in your car. That's what I did. (laughs) I was like, wow. Okay. So faith is acting like God told you the truth. Faith will always overcome fear. Every time. You want to get out of fear, you got to get in faith. It works every time. There's no conditions to it. Peter believed and obeyed Jesus' call. He never questioned the call. He seemed to just act it on faith, and he believed. He knew no matter the size, no matter what's going on, the size of the storm, no matter what the storm looks like, it's safer, remember. It's safer in the middle of a storm with Jesus. Are you getting this? Been hiding in a boat by yourself. Because when you believe the lie, Satan doesn't stay with you and comfort you. He leaves. Okay, um, so Peter experienced a moment in his life that would never, he would never forget that. I'm going to give you a little extra. This isn't in my notes, but I did learn this. Mark, they, they, theologians think that Peter was telling Mark what to write in the book of Mark. When this story is not mentioned like this, and they believe that it was because Peter got it. He could have said he was the scribe. He, I mean, he was the one telling the scribe what to write, Mark. 
He could have said, tell him I walked on the water. Tell him about the miracle. It's not in there, y'all. He says, tell him about God and how powerful he is. Tell him how glorious he is. Okay, I can identify with Peter and his mouth and his actions and all his big bad stuff, but I want to be identified like that. How about you? Give God the glory. Tell him about Jesus. That was extra. Okay, while preparing this lesson, I was reminded of someone else who had a moment. Have you ever watched any of the Charlie Brown shows? I know some of you have. If you have, you're probably familiar with Linus. Okay. When I, quickly, when I said Linus, a picture came to your mind. What was it? His blanket. He carried that blanket. He's always holding on to that security blanket. But just like Peter, Linus had a moment, and many people don't know about the moment. There's a scripted scene where Linus just lets go of his security blanket. He drops it. I am convinced that it was very intentional. We're going to watch a clip from the Charlie Brown Christmas, but before we do, before you put it up, Doug, I want you to notice the moment that Linus drops the blanket. What words are is he speaking? I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. What did he say? Right? What two words did he say right before he dropped the blanket? Fear not. It's pretty clear what Charles... This is my, this is a Michelle Miller thing. What Charles was saying through this, and I think it's simply brilliant. This scene is all about Jesus. It's a Chris, this is from um, a Christmas, Charlie Brown Christmas. Mm -hmm. We know that Jesus was born at Christmas. It's about his birth. It's also about why Jesus came. Jesus came to save us. He came to deliver us from our fears. Okay? Jesus came to separate us from our fears so we could live by faith. Jesus is the only reason we can simply drop our fears like Linus. We can drop the fears and the lies that we've been holding tightly onto as a security blanket, which is a lie, by the way. We can trust and need to cling only to Jesus and his truth. In the midst of fear and insecurity, this simple cartoon is telling us, fear not. Jesus is here. Jesus is the answer. So, I'm going to ask you a question, the same question for a year that Jesus has been asking me time and time again on different occasions. What is keeping you in the boat? Are you like the other disciples? I've been there. Are you in fear? 
Are you doubting what you really heard was from Jesus? I've been there. Are you waiting for your circumstances to change? When my life looks like this, I'll lead a life group. When my life does this, I'll do that. Whatever it is. Okay? Are you walking by faith? I'm just telling you what Jesus has me. I'm just sharing my story with you. Are you walking by faith? Are you walking by what you see? Because if you're not walking by faith over here, you're walking by what you see, and you're walking by fear. Remember, fear is the opposite of faith. Is fear keeping you in your boat? Here's the greatest part, that if I could do cartwheels and stuff, I would. I'd have to get Stella, my reading daughter, up here to do it for me. You were never meant to stay in the boat. You were created to get out of the boat. You were created to experience miracles. Peter had seen miracles, but he got to experience one for himself. But you won't experience them in the boat. Okay? It's time for us to choose faith over fear. If you want to experience the power of God in your life, you have to take a step of faith and you have to get out the boat. I'm going to go down saying that for the rest of my life. This is my story. Remember Jesus said, and when Jesus says it, it's important, it's truth, and we need to take heed to it. Jesus said, do not be afraid. Take courage. You know what he was saying? Choose courage. Don't choose fear. He was saying choose courage. I'm going to ask everybody just to bow your head and close your eyes. Just get still before the Lord. I have two questions for you. The first one. How many of you would say, I am in a storm right now. It's a hard journey. I know I'm there. Just everyone with your eyes closed, out of respect, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. You can put your hands down. Second question. How many of you have received a direction, a command from the Lord, but you're not stepping out in faith? Something is holding you back, keeping you in fear. And honestly, you want to obey and get out of the boat, but you're struggling. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God sees these hands, ladies. He sees your heart. I want us to remain still and quiet. Just for a minute, with our eyes closed. I want you to listen. This is the word of God. I want you to picture right now Jesus. He's right before you and he's talking to you. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, 7. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Isaiah 41, 10. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, nine. If you want to let go of fear, if you want to get out the boat, we want to pray for you tonight. Can we have our altar workers, our prayer team come up, please?
going to be very bold because I have to obey Jesus. Jesus told me that tonight this word was for people in this room. But he also told me, I don't want them to leave still in fear. I love them too much. I don't want them to leave still in their boat. So if you raise your hand and you want prayer, we're here to agree with you. You can come forward now.